Home, home has a powerful draw on each one of us. I mean, it was as early as 50 AD when Pliny the Elder, the first scientific naturalist uh, in the world, as far as we know, and uh, the great naval commander, after he was, after he finished his travels back and forth across that vast empire, he said, home is where the heart is. In the mid 19th century, uh, a little known English composer uh, put together a little saccharine sweet song that uh, goes something like this, be it ever so humble, there's no place like home. And while it wasn't particularly popular in England, it was sung around Union and Confederate campfires for the entirety of the war by the voices of young men who just wanted one day to go home, and so many did not. Frank Baum, in his greatest novel, picked up on that line and had his heroine, Dorothy, click her ruby slippers together three times and make that incantation. There's no place like home. There's no place like home. And she left the enchant enchantment of Oz and went to the dusty wheat fields of Kansas again. Well, because there is no place like home, is there? Not really. Simon and Garfunkel, at the, at the top of their popularity in the 60s and 70s, when they're playing to sold out crowds all across the world, the great poet of the two, Paul Simon, sat down in a railway station And he said, I wish I were homeward bound. And closer to our own time, E.T. finding himself in a world that really wasn't his, he, he would plead again and again, phone home, phone home. Kay and I encountered a little bit of this uh, earlier this uh, earlier in the summer. In, in the first couple weeks of June, we invited our oldest grandson to join us at Acadia National Park. It's a place that Kay and I love a great deal. And uh, Will had heard us talk about it, and he was fascinated by stories. And so we had him come up, and we walked, the, th the trio of us walked along the coastline, and we walked up ridges and down ravines. And on the evening of June 9th, my wife turned to Will and, and said, Will, tomorrow is your birthday. Uh, what would you like to do? And without hesitation, he said, as soon as the sun is coming up, I want to hike up Cadillac Mountain. Now, Cadillac Mountain is the highest peak between Nova Scotia uh, and the southern Mexico there along the coast. It's not really so difficult to climb unless you are 65 and 66 respectively. If you're 11, it's fairly easy. <laughs> but by 10.30 we had summited it and when we got to the top, the, the wind blowing ferociously across it was freezing. Uh, and uh, we realized immediately we had on too few clothes. Uh, and we looked, though, off to the west, and we saw uh, the verdant village of Bar Harbor nestled against the bay, a place that Kay and I uh, love a great deal. And then we looked to the east, and there was the raging gray and green waters of the North Atlantic. It was, you know, a portrait of God's majesty beyond compare. And all at once, without warning, Will put his arms around me. And he looked up at my face and he said, Granddaddy, thank you for bringing me here. I thought, who was leading who? But uh, uh, thank you for bringing me here. And with the next breath, he said, do you think I could phone home? Now, you ought to try to get any type of signal in Maine at all. But, uh, but up on that mountain, so I'm walking all over and we found enough signal and he and he called his home and he spoke to his mother and his daddy and his brother and his sister. And that was the reunion he needed on his birthday. And a, and a truth came uh, resounding to me, and that is, whereas Will is very comfortable with Kay and me, with his grandmother and his granddaddy, 
We're not his real home. His real home were with those four. And so he wanted to phone home. Jesus encounters a little of this um, when he goes uh, to Nazareth, his hometown. Let's face it, he grew up there <laughs> until he was about 29 or 30. And um, what he discovers is that it really isn't his real home. I mean, he gets there, and at first people were enamored by his, the wisdom of his speech and the miracles they've heard that he can do at his hands, the exorcisms that he's performed. But then one person in the crowd who's gathered around in the synagogue says, what, 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 wait a minute. Isn't this the carpenter? Isn't this the one who used to repair our tables and chairs and so forth? And then another said, yeah, and his brothers are with us. James and Joseph and Judas and his sisters live here too. And then uh, still another said, yeah, this is, this is Mary's boy. And they... And they really despised him all of a sudden. And what Jesus knows is what we know too, is that Nazareth, as quaint as it may be, uh, was not Jesus' real home. Heaven was his real home. The scripture bears this out. Um, in the year, I guess about 55, 56, Paul writes in his magnificent letter to the Colossians, um, yeah, I think it's... Uh, Chapter 1, 15, Jesus Christ is the image of the invisible Father. Through him all things came to be, and in him they all have their being. He is the, he is the composer from heaven, making all, all that I'm looking at, and all that you see. Heaven is his real home. And John, writing later in the century, um, says what we should have known all along. He came to those who were his own, but his own received him not. Because, well, his real home was, was heaven. And I'm here to testify to you this morning that um, heaven is our real home too. It's our real home. Now, I don't preach about this much because it lays Christians open for such criticism. Um, Sigmund Freud would be, uh, would be one of those voices, but the most, uh, the most ferocious voice uh, about Christians and their home being in heaven was Karl Marx. And Karl Marx, in his critique of Hegel, wrote this, which are words that have gone down in infamy. Religion is the opium of the masses. What he meant by that, Judaism and Christianity are the opium of the masses, especially Christianity. Why? because we put so much emphasis on our real home, on heaven, that we don't pay enough attention, attention to the world in which we live. You've heard it said, she's so heavenly-minded, she's no earthly good. Well, that's what Marx was saying. But the great C.S. Lewis countered that with this line. He said, those, those who do the most good in this present world are those who thought the most about the next. Those who do the most good in this present world are those who have thought the most about the next. You say, well, Pat, how can that be? Well, the scripture also bears this out. I mean, in the greatest, in the, in the, in the greatest portrait we have of our heavenly home, in the 21st chapter of Revelation, John has this vision of the new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven adorned as a bride for her bridegroom, Jesus Christ. It is a magnificent city. And if you do the math, all you math guys, I see my partner Lou Kissling here, the great banker. When he did the math, he would find out that the new Jerusalem is 1,500 square miles. In other words, John is saying there's room for all of us. But more importantly, in, uh, as we get to 21.4, John makes this observation. In, this, in our real home, in the New Jerusalem, God is wiping away all the tears from our eyes. And there is no death. And there is no pain. There is no suffering. Because the first things have passed away. And then, if that's not enough, and... Chapter 21, verse 22, John goes on and says, But I looked, 
in the great New Jerusalem, and there was no temple there. There's no temple there. Why? Because the Lamb who presides there, Jesus Christ, the suffering one, because he's consecrated every inch of those 1,500 square miles. It's all the temple. Every bit of it. It's all sacred. And if there's no temple, there's no professional priesthood. In other words, these jokers up here who are cross-dressing are out of a job. Um, there's no professional priesthood because we all finally realize that we're all priests of God. And we're the ones drying the tears. And we're the ones eliminating suffering. And we're the ones who are stepping across the breach. And as we experience that in San Antonio, I'm here to tell you that every centimeter beneath the, the glittering tower of the Frank Frost Bank building is sacred ground. It is God's temple. And every centimeter beneath the man who's sleeping beneath cardboard, beneath the overpass, is sacred ground. It is God's temple. And every bit of land that, that makes up the city block of Christ Church is sacred ground. But so is the HEB. And so is the medical clinic. It's all sacred. And if we will claim our true home, we will be priests in this place. And quit treating the church like it's some type of Hilton concierge, concierge where we come and make our orders for sacred services but we'll spend our time serving one another because we know our home, right? We know our home. In the 13th chapter of Hebrews, the unknown author says, here we have no, la we have no lasting city, but we're looking for the city to come. Where do you look? You look at each other. You, you are evidence of the city to come. Of our real home. Our real home. And that is the, the vision that the, that the real founders of this country had. You know, at one point in Philippians, Paul, uh, I believe it's the third chapter, the 20th verse, he says, he says, Christians are a colony of heaven on earth. I believe the word is, oh God, I'm going to butcher this. Um, I believe the word is something like palet duma, which means we're a commonwealth of heaven. We've been placed here on earth. Now, that would have made, made a lot of sense writing to the, the church in Philippi because they were a colony of Rome. And when Rome colonized a place, it took people from Rome, leading, leading, a, leading citizens, and placed them in Philippi. And they would make it like Rome. And when they're their tenure was finished, they'd go back to Rome. Okay? Well, here we are. Paul says, Christians are a colony of heaven on earth. We're colonizing the earth for Christ to make it like our real home. Does that make sense to you? Well, it made sense to the first people that came to this land. There's so much misinformation about America, it drives me kabongas. But uh, one of the oldest documents we have was, of course, written by <clears throat> an attorney. Surprise, surprise. Um, it was written by an attorney called John Winthrop. And he loaded up a ship of 700 people off the coast of England and took the treacherous voyage from there to here in the year 1630, 146 years before the Declaration of Independence was signed. And when they got off the coast of Massachusetts, off the coast of Salem, he wouldn't let anybody off the boat until he, well, preached to them. And this is what he said. This is part of what he said. You can read it yourself, the whole document. On the deck of the Arabella, he said this. When we get all, when we get to our, to our home, we must delight in one another. We must make the conditions of the other person our condition. We must rejoice together. We must suffer together. We must mourn together. 
we must labor together. And if we do that, the Lord God Almighty will delight in us. And we will become a city on a hill because all the world will be looking at us. We must delight in one another. That is what America could be. That is what Christians should be. And that is how we make a home.